So good evening, everyone. It is really so good to see everybody's faces out there. Thank you all so much for joining our event this evening to celebrate our veterans. I'm Kim Blosser. I'm president at Lord Fairfax Community College, and I really just am so grateful you all could join us. Um, I want to start by thanking Chris Lambert for putting this program together. Chris normally coordinates this wonderful in-person Veterans Day ceremony for us on our Fauquier campus, and I'm really grateful for him for finding a way that we could continue to do something to honor our veterans, even though we just can't all be together in person. You know, today I had been thinking a lot about uh, the Veterans Day ceremony that we're having tonight, thinking about the veterans and their families and the fact that we're meeting virtually because of this pandemic. And, you know, it really, um, it really kind of humbled me. I thought about the fact that we're asked to wear masks and all of us are probably thinking about the upcoming holidays and how we might be spending less time with our families um, and that you know, we're just kind of tired of this new normal that we're dealing with. And then I thought about all of the sacrifices that our veterans and their families have made over the years. And I was a little ashamed that I have thought about um, the little bit of time maybe that I'm missing when I think about all of the sacrifices and the time that veterans and their families are away from other family members. Um, and so it just didn't seem like much of a sacrifice for me to put on a mask or maybe miss a little bit of time when I compare it to what our veterans have had to do. Recently, uh, it also made me think about a communication, um, a conversation that I'd had recently with a veteran in our community. They uh, were presenting a resolution to have a bridge named in honor of a serviceman that was killed in the Vietnam War. And he was sharing the story about when he graduated high school and he enlisted and he was completing basic training. And at the end of that, he shared with his, um, uh, with someone there that he had hoped that he would be stationed somewhere on the East Coast so that he'd have an opportunity to see his parents. Um, and he said, unfortunately, he got his wish, but he was on the East Coast of Japan. And it was two years before he saw his parents the next time. And so I think about those kind of sacrifices and, and the ones that have certainly made even more sacrifices than that um, as we're honoring our veterans today. And so speaking of veterans, I want to introduce you to um, a very distinguished veteran, our guest speaker, Lieutenant General Ben Freakley. General Freakley is, is retired from the U.S. Army after serving more than 36 years of active military service. And during his career, he led our soldiers and military forces in combat three different times through Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, through Operation Iraqi Freedom, and through Operation Enduring Freedom. General Freakley is a Central High School graduate from Woodstock. He holds a bachelor's degree in engineering from the United States Military Academy at West Point and a master's degree in advanced military studies. And currently, he serves as a professor of leadership for Arizona State University. And he's also a special advisor to the university's president, Michael Crow, for leadership initiatives. And he serves at the McCain Institute for International Leadership. And what we're the most happy about is he also serves as a member of our Lord Fairfax College Board. And so I am honored to welcome Lieutenant General Ben Freakley with us this evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blosser, um, and I hope, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Just to make sure I know I'm not totally in control of all the technology Chris is. But thank you, Dr. Blosser, and I would just like to thank the faculty and staff at Lord Fairfax Community College for honoring our veterans today. I'd like to particularly uh, thank Chris Lambert, and I'd like to thank Carolyn Wood, and I'd also like to thank Ashley Hansen, my pal, who keeps me uh, uh, aware of all these things and, and, in fact, extended a very kind invitation, but I'd also like to thank uh, the Lord Fairfax Community College team for what you do to serve the community and provide education and portals for pathways for the young men and women uh, across the served area, not just Shenandoah County, but our other counties as well that provide a pathway to success in education for the citizens in the surrounding area. So thank you for that. Um, so today we, we honor our veterans. This all started at the 11th hour of the 11th day, at the 11th month uh, in 1918, when a cessation of hostilities happened between 
the uh, German powers and the allies to stop the First World War. And it was known for Armistice Days for years until 1954, when President Eisenhower, after World War II and Korea, changed it from Armistice Day, which recognized our World War I veterans to all those who had served, quite frankly, and we go forward today. And you know what, while we do recognize the veterans, and thank you for doing that, as Dr. Blosser pointed out, it is critically important to recognize the families, for they too serve. Uh, those young men and women uh, get hauled around the world, as our five sons did, and my bride from Woodstock, Virginia has, and uh, they do it selflessly. They go to all four of our five sons went to a different high school uh, their senior year. Uh, quite frankly, I would say they're better for it, but some people might say they're not. Uh, but our families make tremendous sacrifices. Uh, moms and dads aren't there for birthdays and other significant celebrations because they're either deployed or they're in combat. Um, I have never forgotten where I came from, and that is Shenandoah County, and I greet you tonight from Woodstock, in fact. Um, and so I was asked to comment a little bit about Veterans Day, veterans, and about my observations after almost as Dr. Blosser said, uh, 30, almost 37 years at active duty and four years at West Point, so in a uniform for 41 years. Um, I would first say that um, it is amazing uh, uh, and an honor to serve with the men and women that populate our ranks. They are phenomenal Americans. They're men and women who volunteer to put themselves in harm's way so we can have a peaceful life at home and try to prevent violence from reaching our shores. But they also advance American ideals. While many of them fight, and you know about that part, but what you don't know about is the countless days and hours away from home that they spend training other militaries. There was mention of Special Forces friends tonight and how around the world tonight, small teams of 12 men and women are deployed in many, many countries, uh, not fighting, but providing medical support and military training and just basic support to other uh, military and uh, uh, professionals who secure, you know, first line responders. Our special forces train other militaries to secure their own country so we don't have to. And out on our ships, uh, you know, tonight out in the in the waterways, the dark waterways across the world, uh, sailors and Coast Guards men and women are keeping our, our trade routes open. Uh, you know, you wouldn't think about it, but tonight there's Coast Guardsmen off the coast of Somalia to keep pir pirates from mounting our, our trade vessels and so the oil can flow freely. Uh, you know, in, in Africa, if, if people don't get oil for a week, they starve because they cook over the top of those fuels. And they get that oil because the United States Navy and, and the United States Coast Guard and our allies keep the shipping lanes open from those who would close them down. So it's, it's, it was such an honor to serve. And what kept me in for 36 plus years is serving with the families and the other members. Of course, I also got to <laughs> live and go to 13 other countries. And there it's so wonderful to see other cultures and see the richness of what they bring uh, to the world and how they solve problems. In my uh, 13 months in Afghanistan, the literacy rate is 22% uh, of the population can read and write. And yet, I saw irrigated fields where the water was flowing uphill. They had figured out ways to take the water coming off the mountain and redirect it from the pressure of the water without any pumps, without any electricity, and through irrigation, direct that water back uphill uh, so they could irrigate their lands and feed their families. And so sometimes while we think that literacy is the whole ticket, it's amazing to see the common sense and the problem solving that people in other cultures around the globe uh, bring to the human existence. Uh, I also got to live in 12 different states. And while e pluribus unum, one from all, from many, uh, we are 54 different uh, cultures out there, as you all well know, but it's what makes America great. I think what makes our, our country and our military so wonderful is our diversity. Uh, we celebrate women, men, African Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, Hispanics, you name it, they're celebrated in the military and they're recognized, they're promoted at the same rank. There is no pay gap between men and women. Uh, female Lieutenant Generals made the exact same amount of money I did. Uh, if they were met in the Medical Corps, they made more than I did, but that's okay. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, a female private and a male private make the same thing. 
because it's about equality and justice and diversity. But it is amazing to see that when um, you include others from other cultures and other beliefs and other races in your work, how strong you can be and what great ideas they bring to the table. Um, I would also say that what I experienced joining the Army in well, West Point in 1971 is the amazing transformation that the Army went through from a draft Army, uh, our military, from a draft military to an all volunteer force. And, 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 and mostly too, that the Vietnam veterans reinvented our military. And those men and women who were treated so horribly by our country when they came home from a war that they didn't ask for and a war that they didn't necessarily volunteer to serve in because they were draftees. Many did volunteer. They wanted to make a difference and provide freedom to the people of South Vietnam. But yet doing their duty, they were despised when they came home for many factors, which we can't talk about tonight. But instead of quitting and being um, disgruntled, they reinvented our military. And I honestly believe going from young second lieutenant to old lieutenant general, we stood on the shoulders of those giants, those non-commissioned officers in particular, who retrained us, who gave us new ways of fighting, who fought for new kind of weaponry, for more education, more educational opportunities, a better educated military. We have that today because of our Vietnam veteran. And I, for one, am extremely grateful for their own service, their own sacrifice and what they did to reinvent our military. And I would just say that our non-commissioned officer corps, we often sometimes talk about the officer side. And while that's somewhat interesting, the American military is, is incredibly stronger and more capable than any other military in the world because of our non-commissioned officers. Uh, those men and women who are technical experts in their field, 150 different fields. Everything, foreign military guys can't understand when I tell them that everything I ever learned in the military was taught to me by a non-commissioned officer. How to jump out of an airplane, how to scuba dive, how to use a weapon, how to land navigate, how to do first aid. Whatever it was technically, it was taught to me by a non-commissioned officer. So we really need to celebrate the success of our military because of our non-commissioned officers. And I would just say in, in closing that um, it really showed me what selfless service was all about. Because many times, many people who had nothing uh, gave their all for our country. Uh, this is not Memorial Day. Uh, this is to celebrate those veterans who have served and are living. But I'll just close with a story about selflessness about Sergeant First Clad Jerry Monte. Sergeant Monte was a sergeant in the 10th Mountain Division, which I commanded in combat uh, from 2006 to 2007. As a young man, he stood out right away in his community because such a, he was such a giver. He one time said to his parents, the family down the street, we've got to go buy them ornaments for their Christmas tree. And his father said, well, son, we can't do that because they don't have a tree even. He said, no, they have a tree. And his father said, how do you know they have a tree? He said, I cut the one down in our front yard. And uh, when packages would come to Afghanistan for him, he would give them to his soldiers or to the Afghan who live in incredible poverty. And um, in 2006, in the summer, his organization of 16 men were surrounded by over 50 Taliban. And one of his soldiers got separated from the other 16. And he went out three times to rescue that soldier and gave his life in rescuing that soldier, but was killed and therefore is a recipient of the Medal of Honor. But Jared Monty lived a life of selfless service, of putting others before self, from that young man uh, in, in, in his hometown, giving his family living tree up out front to uh, uh, what Abraham Lincoln said in the Lincoln uh, Gettysburg Address, giving the last full measure of devotion uh, by giving his life. He didn't lose his life. He gave his life to his fellow soldiers to preserve them in combat. And we remember that uh, as we remember all of our veterans, this idea of selfless service, I really saw it. And I saw that all could contribute, all can make a team differently. And I would just say that all of us recognize veterans, it's a high calling to serve the constitution. And while we have all this talk going on right now about the election, I would just tell all the listeners to stand firm because your military folks serving understand that they've pledged an oath to the constitution, not a, not a person and the constitution and we the people will prevail 
and the dem democracy will go forward and we will have peace and we will get through the pandemic and we'll be better for it. Thank you for tonight. I'm honored to have spoken to you and I look forward to hearing from our other veterans. Thank you. General Freakley, thank you so much. Uh, for your thoughtful and inspirational words. I'm Caroline Wood, I'm the Associate Vice President of Academic Support and Student Services here at LFCC, and I'll be taking you through the rest of the evening with our other guest speakers. We have a large docket of Army veterans tonight. So it is an, uh, an Army reunion, so go Army. So first tonight, we have a student veteran. We have Eric Gall Gallivies joining us. So Eric, if you just want to spend a few minutes uh, telling us a little bit about your story. Yeah, so I'm sorry, can't see, there you go. Uh, so yeah, I uh, served in the Army for 11 years uh, as a combat medic, uh, eight years uh, active duty, three years in the Texas Army National Guard. Uh, I'm originally from Texas and I joined the army because, you know, I grew up in a military uh, household, semi-military household. Um, I don't remember my dad being in the military because I was way too young, uh, but I did grow up hearing all the stories and, and uh, seeing the things that he did because he was a paratrooper during Vietnam. And uh, so that's kind of what, uh, inspired me to, to be in the military to begin with. I joined a little later in life. I was about 27 when I joined. I had turned 28 in basic. Uh, and I remember that day vividly because uh, I went to um, Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic training. And on my 28th birthday, I happened to throw grenades that day. So that was very interesting. Um, I obviously didn't tell the drill sergeant it was my birthday because I didn't feel like getting smoked. Uh, but, you know, hearing all those stories and, and, and seeing how it affected everyone and seeing how hearing, seeing and how it changed them from when they were younger to, to as they got older, I kind of wanted to have that experience as well. And, and had it gave me that desire to serve um, my brother and brother-in-law who were younger than me, they joined before I did and they were part of the initial push in Iraq. They were both Marines and when they came back, I wasn't able to relate to them because they had a different experience than I, was, than I did because I was still a civilian. And then when I got back, I was able to relate to not only my brother and brother-in-law, but my dad as well, because as I said, he was a Vietnam vet. I was able to relate to them better and understand where they were coming from. Um, so that was definitely something I enjoyed and something uh, that was interesting to me. Um, my first deployment was to Iraq. Um, we were, initially on the, what's called MSR, MSR Tampa or the main route up to Baghdad. And then we were shifted to the border of Iran in the Mason province. And uh, that's where I saw more of what, what I was meant to do as a medic. Um, But, you know, that was, that was an interesting time. However, it wasn't all just um, military stuff. I did happen to go see the, uh, the Ziggurat of Or during our, I guess you can call it layover. Um, we, our chaplain, I should say, came up to us and asked, who wants to go see the Ziggurat? And I had no idea what a Ziggurat was at the time. And for those who don't know, Ziggurat's an ancient temple. And uh, so I wouldn't, go, I wouldn't happen to actually see that. Um, it's just outside of uh, Cobb Adder, which is in Talil. 
so that was very interesting. I have pictures of that, and that's something I'll never forget. You know, not many people can say that they got to see a ziggurat in person and not only see it, but climb up to the top and see the entire landscape. So that was fun. But um, as I said, you know, I'm originally from Texas. And when I joined the army, I expected to be transferred all over the place, to go wind up moving all over the place. However, my first station was at Fort Hood, Texas. And I, that's where I deployed out of. When I got back, I, I was transferred to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. And then I wound up in, transferred to uh, Korea. And then I wound up in El Paso, Texas. So I didn't really get to leave Texas except for one time and my, my two deployments. Um, that was kind of, as much as I love Texas, I, I will always be a Texan. I would like to have seen other states <laughs> or at least some other places, more of them. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I did enjoy my time. I do miss it sometimes. I do have, and I don't know about anyone else here at the moment, but you know, the experiences I, I have, you know, I still carry with me and, and, you know, sometimes I do have a hard time sleeping and that's something that I'll always carry. So, um, I don't know if anyone else will speak about that here, but yeah, that's something that will always be with me because of the things that I went through, you know? So, uh, I'm not sure what else to say here. <laughs> well, we appreciate it, Eric. And, and really, we appreciate all of our veteran students. They bring so much experience and life to our classes and, and LFCC. <clears throat> and, and when we talk about sacrifices, we know that yeah. even when you're not in the Army anymore, that that you're still making sacrifices often um, because of those experiences. And we appreciate it. Thank you so much for yeah, and, tonight. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I didn't, as I said, I did enjoy it. And it's something I'll always carry with me. I do, uh, I don't know what anyone else does, but for me, and as uh, a couple of people may know, I crochet, which is what helps me calm down, so. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight, Eric. And so that's a, advice for everyone else. So crocheting is something you can do with your hands and, and calm yep. down a lot of us Absolutely. do things like that. So also we have uh, a professor here. We have a couple of, of veteran professors. We're gonna start with Mike St. Jock, who is also an army veteran and has a really interesting history uh, and is a Russian expert. So uh, he always fascinates us with his, his tales. So we're looking forward to hearing from him, Professor St. John. Can everybody hear me? Gotcha. Excellent. So hi, I'm Mike St. Jacques. Um, I'm originally from Massachusetts. Uh, my involvement in the army stemmed from uh, an extreme lack of discipline after my first semester of college. And uh, that lack of discipline led to lack of money. And I realized that I probably should go somewhere where they specialize in that sort of thing. And so I went to um, the, the school where Dr. F where uh, General Freakley was the Dean, the Fort Benning School for um, Misguided Boys and learned to become an infantryman. Uh, I joined the Massachusetts Army National Guard as a scout. Weirdly enough, I ended up in the exact same unit that my brother used to command when he was in that same exact position, except I was a private who knew nothing and he was a second lieutenant who knew nothing. And um, 
I decided that, you know, after working with these Rangers and these really, really high speed, just very well trained uh, soldiers that had all had tons of experience that I wanted to join the regular army and I wanted to go special forces. Went down to the recruiter, um, asked him, said, hey, I, I want to join the army. I want uh, infantry guaranteed. I want airborne guaranteed and I want a ranger option. And he said, we can't do that. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go talk to the Marines. And he went, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Maybe we can talk. And so uh, he kind of tried to um, go around that by saying, well, let me see what your scores are and we'll see if you can actually get in here. And uh, he looked at my ASVAB scores and he said, are these right? <laughs> I said, yes, they're, they're right. And he said, and you want to go infantry? I said, yeah. And he said, why? <laughs> I said, well, A, because it's awesome flying around in helicopters, blowing things up and shooting machine guns, because let's face it, that's all a 19-year-old wants to do. And um, he said, how does six months to a year in Monterey, California, studying a foreign language sound to you? And I said, that sounds better than eating dirt, I suppose. <laughs> and so um, the long and the short of it is they sent me to Monterey, California, and um, I went through the Russian basic course, 47 weeks. I knew nothing of Russian when I started. And by the time I left, I had a 5,000 word active vocabulary. And, um, and the really rough part was, was waking up in the mornings and looking out of my balcony, drinking my coffee over the Pacific Ocean, which was really tough. And then, uh, so I went from an army base that had no guns to an air force base in Texas that had no planes. Um, where they gave me some training on stuff that I really can't talk about here. And then they sent me to Massachusetts to another base where I got more training that I also cannot talk about here. And then they sent me to um, Wiesbaden, Germany, where I worked at the 1st MI Battalion. Um, most of my unit at the time was still deployed downrange because of the first Gulf War. And uh, when they came back, we started doing live missions against the, um, the Russians. The wall had fallen in 89. This was 91. And I happened to be working the day that, um, by the way, my job was a 98 Gulf Russian cryptologic voice intercept operator. Um, so basically anything to do with electronic warfare, jamming, intercept direction, finding that kind of thing. I can tell you all that. That's totally in, in the clear. Um, but uh, the day that they had the coup in Moscow, the attempted coup, I was working that day. So um, hearing about that was, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so we were working on that, let's just put it that way. And it turned into a very, very long week. Um, I really enjoyed living in Germany. Uh, it was a huge opportunity for someone like me. I grew up dirt poor. Uh, opportunity was not one of those things that was going to happen to us. Uh, I originally, like I said, I originally lived in Massachusetts for five years of my life. I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, one of the worst crime areas um, that there is in, in North Phoenix. I saw my first murder victim when I was 10. So it, it was a rough area. So getting an opportunity, like learning Russian and getting a top secret security clearance and going on and doing stuff like this was unfathomable to me. You know, being able to hop into a car and drive to France or, or Denmark or whatever. Um, I was eventually transferred back to Colorado where I went to, uh, to work with the 104th MI Battalion at Fort Carson, Colorado, or as a lot of people call it, Fort Incarceration. I liked it. I didn't think it was that bad. Um, the only downside was I hurt my leg hurt my knee uh, and I'm an avid skier, or at least I was. The, the, the summer that I get there, I heard it before I could go skiing in the Rockies and it basically took a year to get the thing fixed. But in that time, um, I was sent to the Worldwide Language Olympics where I medaled and I uh, eventually was interviewed by the on-site inspection agency. And for those of you that don't know what that is, the on-site inspection agency was created to implement the INF treaty, the Intermediate and Shorter Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. And at that point, they had also uh, added in the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. And so they gave me an interview in English, an interview in Russian, and they went over my, uh, my files. And I thought there's absolutely no way 
that I'm possibly going to be getting into this thing. And um, amazingly enough, three of us actually did. And so I went to Monterey again. I went to the intermediate and advanced course. Um, they taught me some more Russian. And then they sent me out to the headquarters at uh, Dulles International Airport. And so I worked in the start nuclear division. I used to fly over the former Soviet Union. That's me right there, a much younger Saint Jacques. Um, and behind me is an SS-20 intermediate range nuclear missile shell. Um, so I, I worked a couple of times as the deputy chief of arms control in Almaty, Kazakhstan, the, in the embassy there. I worked at the semi palatins nuclear test range at the Deglin Mountain Project closing uh, underground nuclear test holes. I worked on non-proliferation projects here and in um, the former Soviet Union with US Customs and Border Patrol and other agencies. Um, and probably the most interesting thing I did was uh, I was the lead technical interpreter for an, uh, something called Operation Auburn Endeavor, where uh, this is, a, I'll, I'll try to keep it short because I know that you should either make these stories interesting or short. I'm trying to do both. So I had just come back from an inspection in Siberia in February, which as you might have guessed is slightly chilly. And um, some of the other interpreters came up and said, hey, uh, Mike, do you, uh, do you wanna go to Georgia for an ad hoc mission? And I'm immediately thinking Atlanta. Yeah, that'd be great. What's going on down there? I don't know, maybe uh, Jimmy Carter needs an interpreter. And that wasn't unheard of for our agency. They'd like to pick us out and, and throw us into things like that. And so I went to talk to my boss and he said, okay, um, you wanna go to this? I'm like, yeah. And he said, you leave Friday. I'm like, that's fine. Anywhere warm, I'm good. And uh, he said, well, we've got your, your travel advance. And he, he quoted a number that was really big. And I thought I was kind of surprised. And they said, just go down to travel, get your tickets, and we'll get you your emergency entrance visa uh, when you get in country. And I was like, get into, oh, man. And it was Soviet Georgia, of course, three weeks after they just tried to assassinate Shepard Nazi. And my hotel was right across the street from that. So uh, I was supposed to be there 10 days. I ended up being there a month and a half without telling anybody what I was doing, because when I left, I had no idea. They gave me a stack of, of materials on theoretical nuclear physics and said, come up with vocabulary for this. You're going to need it. OK, get there. And the long and the short of it is we were getting weapons grade plutonium, plutonium and uranium out of the country because um, it wasn't in a stable facility. And uh, when you get back, you look back at that kind of thing and you're like, wow, how do I top that? How, how do I top any of these things that I've done as an E5? That was as an E5, just a buck sergeant. And so I got out for a year. Um, I actually did stand up comedy for a year. And I was so good that I went back in the National Guard because, um, well, A, I missed it. And um, I decided that I didn't want to drive all the way to Maryland to do Intel stuff. So I joined the local guard unit, which was the 29th Infantry Division, third of the 116th, the tip of the spear for D Day. And uh, I figured. It's not like we're in a war or anything. That was 2000. So <laughs> 2001 hits and I ended up on the, uh, the airport mission and then eventually ended up getting deployed to Afghanistan, not to steal his thunder with um, Brian Higgins, who's going to be speaking here. Uh, so he and I are actually combat buddies. We, uh, we were at Bagram Airfield uh, as the perimeter security company, um, did rotations down in Ghazni. I was in a a particular um, garden spot called Wardak. Uh, I'm sure um, General Freakley knows exactly what I'm talking about and just how much of a garden spot it is. Um, and while we were there, uh, you know, you, you basically you did patrols um, and just as, as um, Eric, a previous speaker was saying, um, you know, sometimes things get to you. Uh, the fire, like gunfire never bothered me. Even after we'd been in a firefight, it just didn't bother me rockets that was the thing because we got rocketed all the time and as the year went by they got closer and closer and closer until one until they were landing within like you know 50 100 yards of our bee huts and that's what finally got me and, and i'll be the first one to admit when i came back from afghanistan um and i was a single dad and that was the end of, of my army time um 
the very first, the very first um, New Year's Eve, and in Winchester they always have fireworks at, for New Year's Eve. The very first New Year's Eve, we were having a party, and I disappeared. My my now wife, my then girlfriend, came looking for me, and I was curled up in a corner because I couldn't handle it. I'm good now. And it took a while and it took, you know, talking to professionals to get you through that, but it's very real. And he's absolutely right. Um, that, that stays with you. Your army experience stays with you such that you, you have something in common with other vets. It's kind of a, a head nod thing. And even more so with combat vets, people that have actually been under fire, you, you know, the difference between the, the whistling and the crack. There is a gigantic difference in proximity of bullets. Um, if you see somebody and they're cringing while they're watching the opening scene of Private Ryan, um, they're probably a combat vet because that was fairly accurate. Um, I don't, there's good points and bad points of my career, but I can't, I can't thank the army enough for the opportunities that it's given me. Um, I'll always have that and I'll always have friends that are closer than some of my family. Thank you so much, Professor St. Jock. We appreciate it. And uh, so Professor St. Jock is a professor of history with us at Lord Fairfax Community College. And next we're gonna hear from Joe B. Wood who is an LSCC alumnus. Hello. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Uh, Joby Wood, uh, graduate here at Lord Fairfax, fantastic school. I'm an Army veteran, combat veteran. I started my career off with the 82nd Airborne Division. And I went from there to the 25th Infantry Division, to Wolfhounds in Hawaii. Had uh, about 18 months there and ended up back at Bragg with SFOD. I'm uh, very proud to be able here to speak with everyone today. Um, I do not believe there's any greater honor than to serve your country. It uh, was probably my most fulfilling experience in my entire life. Very good points and very bad times, but it's you take the good with the bad and everything that you do in life. I, uh, when I started off at Bragg, I, my first real tour was with the uh, NMFO in Sinai. First Battalion Airborne 505th Infantry, we were the first to occupy the Sinai when the Israelis gave it back to the Egyptians. We were there for six months and there was no combat involved. We just observed to make sure that the Egyptians did not bring any heavy arms into the Sinai. We spent 20 days in the desert and 10 days in arrear. We did that for six months straight. Fabulous experience. I got to see a lot of the Sinai, uh, Israel, a lot of the great sites in Israel, and got to go to Cairo and Egypt, spent some time over there. Uh, couple tours in Panama with Bragg. I was part of the Grenada operation uh, with uh, SFOD. We did some maneuvers in Africa, South Central and Southeast Africa. It was uh, not pleasant, but it was something I would never give up. Uh, it's an experience that I will never, never forget, and I'm so glad that I was I was part of it. Uh, Eric, you were saying that you haven't had a good night's sleep. Well, nobody sleeps anymore. <laughs> but uh, you get through it. You, I think, we're always going to have some type of. nightmare once in a while or 
just restlessness, tapping your fingers. I never sit with my back to a door in a restaurant. Lots of little things, you know. But uh, I'm, I'm just very proud. And I, I'm a firm believer that everyone, all of the young adults that we have these days should at least try a stint in a branch of the military. And it's not for everyone, don't get me wrong. I was a Bravo and uh, I finished my career as a sniper and I was, I was good at it. But it's not for everyone. But I do believe that the military is great for self-esteem, morality, code of ethics, honor, and the people you're going to meet are going to be lifelong friends. And like the professor was stating, probably closer than your family. I know a lot of my friends are. Uh, I, I'm always thankful to be able to speak to anyone here. It's very difficult for me not to be able to look in someone's face and say, this is what's going on. But I hope I can get the point across that this is, this is a great nation, the greatest nation on the planet. And I just can't say how much it meant to me to be defending it and defending those that are oppressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joby. We really appreciate your service. And also, Joby, I don't know if anybody noted what room he was in. He was in our brand new veteran center at the Falkier campus, a generous donor. Uh, donated some money, so it's finally appointed. And actually, to Joby's point, we uh, how we decorated and how we uh, created the room in the Veterans Center, there are no chairs that have their back to the door. So uh, we we think about you when we plan our uh, our, our our spaces out. Um, also, too, uh, with the Veterans Center, I do want to point out on our call today our Veterans uh, Ceremony that Jean Marie Corrado and Sharon Painter are tireless veterans advisors are with us today and I want to send them thanks too because they do work tireless, tirelessly for our veteran students to make sure that they can get what they need at LFCC. So thank you so much to Sharon and Jean Marie. We really appreciate the work that you do to support our veteran students. Next up is a member of our LFCC police force who is also an Army veteran, uh, Officer Brian Higgins. Who are we? <laughs> Everybody hear me okay? We good? All right. Um, that's a tough act to follow. Um, first off, let me let me wish everybody a happy Veterans Day, and I thank all of you for your service. Um, my battle buddy, um, Mike St. Jock up there, we spent our, spent our time in Afghanistan and, and seen the good and the bad, right, brother? Um, Yep. So um, first off, this this Veterans Day is a little uh, tough. I don't think Mike knew. Um, so my birthday was Sunday. Today's Veterans Day. But a week ago today, oh, me and St. Jacques, uh, Professor St. Jacques, we uh, we served with a set of twin brothers, uh, Finney Kimsey and David Kimsey. And Finney Kimsey lost his battle with PTSD um, on Wednesday. So um, my prayers go out to their family and to his twin brother. They were twins. Um, with that being said, um, so I started my career uh, young and dumb. Me and uh, me and uh, high school didn't really get along, so I decided to get one of those uh, good enough educational diplomas, the GED. Um, my mom signed her parental rights away because I was 17 years old for me to go to boot camp. I went to the uh, School of Misguided Children um, and became an 11 Bravo Infantry Grunt, where uh, I exceeded and excelled in the PT standards. 
and shooting at the rifle range, at which point I was invited to go to airborne school and jump out of perfectly good airplanes for an extra 50 bucks a month, which I thought was a great idea because we're all just trying to make money. Um, I, I did that. And my first duty station was, uh, was in Germany. Um, while I was in Germany, the fir our first combat uh, tour since Vietnam, where everyone was called up, was Desert Storm. Um, I went over there and saw great lands and made, met great people. And uh, as a kid, was pretty much scared out of my wits. Um, had no idea what combat was going to be like. And it pretty much wasn't like anything I saw on TV because now I'm living it instead of watching it. Um, thank God it only lasted 100 hours. Uh, we went in, we uh, kicked butt, and we left and came home and uh, and uh, um, freed the Iraqi people from uh, from their dictator, Mr. Saddam Hussein. Um, I came back, and I, too, was in the 29th Infantry, where I met my buddy over there, my battle buddy, Professor St. Jot, and uh, we went in the woods. We got muddy. We got dirty. We got ticks. We got chiggers. Um, no sleep. Um, food really wasn't all that great. Um, it was just barely enough to get us by. But uh, it's like everybody says, you build this bond. Um, and I'd do anything in the world for any of my battle buddies, for anyone that I've served with, uh, both, both then and now. After Desert Storm and after the 29th, um, Pretty much the same thing. 9-11 happened. I went to Dulles Airport. Um, they told me that I was to stand guard there with my loaded M16 and look for terrorists. Problem was that they couldn't tell me what they looked like. Um, they just said to try to make sure the American people felt safe and that they continue to fly and go to Miami Beach, Florida and you know, um, down to Georgia where Mike was trying to get to um, <laughs> and places like that. That lasted a year. Um, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, I think that was with Charlie company. I don't think it was the entire battalion. I think it was a volunteer with Charlie company out of the 29th. Um, from there, Bosnia happened and that was after air assault school. Um, for some reason I thought it'd be a great idea to repel out of helicopters instead of jumping out of planes and they call us, uh, dopes on a rope. So at hundred feet, you repel out of a helicopter on a rope to get inserted into combat action. Um, where hostile fire is behind enemy lines, wherever they need you to go. Um, that's really not the whole story about air assault. It's actually sling loading operations and preparing equipment to be airlifted to get them to the front lines. And you're pretty much the security element that makes that happen. After that tour, after at school, I went to Bosnia. Um, like Professor St. Jock, it was extremely cold. Every cold weather piece of equipment that Uncle Sam issued me, I wore and it still was not enough. Um, our mission was to try to keep the Serbians from picking on the Croatians. Um, that, was a, that was a year long tour, it was cold. If nobody knows anything about Bosnia, it's one of the most heavily mined areas in the world. Um, nobody ever made maps of where they put their landmines, their tow poppers or any of the bomblets that came out of airplanes. So everything is unstable. And at any given day, something would just blow up. Uh, one morning I came up from under the bridge where we stayed um, to relieve the duties of the night crew. Um, so night security was, was filling us in on what had happened throughout the night. And while I was sitting on a, a sandbag where the machine gun nest was, probably about 75 meters out in front of us was a huge explosion. We got covered in dirt and snow and everybody came running. And um, all that field out there had supposedly been cleared. They used these things called flailers, which is on the front of a tank to blow the things up. There's mine detectors that go out and try to disarm them or they blow them in place. This one got missed. The sun happened to be sitting on it just right as the snow was melting. It was unstable and it blew up. Uh, nobody got hurt, but it scared the bejesus out of me. From Bosnia, I came home, and again, I'm still with the 29th ID. Um, and that was when we started training up to take our tour down to Afghanistan, 
which was in 2004, 2005. It was an 18 month tour. Uh, he was in Wardak province. I was downrange in Gosnia, which was a forward observation base. Uh, we pretty much did the same thing. We would do um, security missions, patrols. I was fortunate enough to meet some, some pretty cool people. We were there to train up the um, Afghani uh, national forces, which is basically their police. Um, there's no weapon control. They'll point your weapons at you. They, they, they have no concept of weapon safety. So it's kind of a scary situation in the first place of trying to, to, to get that. that. That seemed to be the first, um, that should have, that, that would seem to be the first thing that we, 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 uh, we, we decided to train them in was don't, don't point this at anything you're not willing to destroy. Um, keep your finger off the trigger because accidents happen. So we trained them to go on missions with us um, so that they could defend their own country without having to send troops over. I met a gentleman, his name was Colonel Adris. He was the police chief for the third emergency response battalion. Uh, this gentleman was um, a Lieutenant for Saddam Hussein and his army during the, the desert storm incident, uh, which I found pretty interesting. Nice guy. Um, he seemed to have changed his ways. Um, he didn't really agree with what Saddam had done. Uh, I remember sitting in his office one time and he called his brother-in-law who happened to live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I talked to him on a satellite phone and he was busy convincing me of how good his brother was and he was a good man. So I, instead of me being in the States talking to someone in Afghanistan, I'm in Afghanistan talking to someone in the States. I thought it was just amazing. Um, again, we just kept doing patrols and we would stop in little towns and just introduce ourselves and have chai tea with village elders and try to find out, well, where Al Qaeda or Taliban were operating in and if we could get any in, intel. Uh, we, we lost two soldiers there, Bobby Beasley and Craig Cherry. God bless them. And I will drink one for them tonight for Veterans Day. Um, I pray for their families. Um, we, we're getting ready to have a 29th Infantry Division. Uh, some, of, some of the folks that we serve with, I was just letting uh, Professor St. Jacques know. He didn't know about it. But um, we're going to do that on the 21st of November where everyone will get together and we'll have some burgers and fries and barbecue and Family and friends will all meet together and 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 see each other and welcome welcome ourselves the best. After I got back from Afghanistan, um, I went on this this uh, I don't know maybe holier than thou kind of mission and decided to go to Rip and I became an Army Ranger and again I went down to the school of misfortunate children and learned how to be an Army Ranger. Um, I got my Ranger tab. And about three months after that, I ended up with the 266 Military Police Company. You remember them, St. Jock. They were just right down the hall from us at the 29th at the, at the Manassas Army, remember? So they recruited me up and was like, wow, you're high speed. You know, why don't you come on over? We need a staff sergeant. We need people to, you know, take control and, and teach us some things. We, you'd be a great asset to our company. And I was like, that sounds great. So they sent me to Fort Pickett where I went to SRT school, which is a special reaction team, which in reality is just a SWAT school for the military. So I go there, I do great. Um, me and the Lieutenant went together and was on the same team and ended up getting um, an outstanding team award while we were at the schools. So we were overachievers in this, which should have been because we both were Army Rangers. So we, we've been through this. We, we kind of know how this works. So we come back and less than three months, I'm getting and receiving orders where I'm being deployed to Iraq with the 266 Military Police Company. So now we're on tour number four. Um, we ended up in Balad at first, which if anybody's been to Iraq, if you know anything about Balad, they call it Mortaritaville because they mortared us every single day, every single night. I think I slept maybe a total of 48 hours the entire 18 months I was there. Um, you, you don't sleep much when people are slinging things at you and they're going boom. Again, it was the same mission as we did in Afghanistan. Um, through Iraq, we went on missions, we drank chai tea, uh, we trained Iraqi police um, 
on how to be better police, um, how to do the right things instead of just rolling into towns, thinking that's the bad guy, snatching them up, duct taping them up, throwing them in the bed of a truck, driving them back to the police headquarters where they execute them. Um, not every crime, which is what we taught them, deserves an execution. It's not murder. It's simple assault. Um, you know, maybe shoplifting, robbery, somebody stole a cow, uh, what have you. We received a lot of gunfire. We got into a lot of firefights. Um, you definitely know the difference between a boom and a crack. You hear the crack, it's pretty close. Um, I had sandbags disintegrate around me. Um, I've had mortars land danger, danger close that I was lucky enough to not get, get wounded. Um, with that mission, I received Bronze Star. I got a Bronze Star with Valor. And when I got home, I decided enough was enough. And I retired. So 21 years, I retired a uh, combat vet and decided I was going to be uh, continue on with my career, become a police officer. So the, the small town Hoodbridge boy that didn't like high school all of a sudden is now a combat vet and he's a police officer. And I'm really not quite sure how any of that occurred. It just kind of happened. I guess doors open and I walked through them. So I'm looking at 15 years as a law enforcement officer. I'm part-time with the Fauquier County Sheriff's Office and I'm full-time now with the Lord Fairfax Community College Police Department where I think I found a home and um, I call everyone here friend and everyone's my family and we all support each other. And um, I, I just wanna thank you all for giving me an opportunity to talk today. And I appreciate each and every one of you and uh, stay safe and stay strong. Officer Higgins, we think you found a home too and we're happy that you're in it. Thank and you. also to uh, Officer Higgins and Professor St. Jacques, we're, our condolences for the loss of your friend. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to Chris Lambert, who is going to do our virtual wall of honor. Got to remember to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Caroline. Um, so uh, usually pre-COVID, uh, we would have uh, actual walls of honor at each campus, at Middletown and at Falkier, where students, staff, faculty could honor our veterans either in their lives, uh, if they've passed or if they're living. Uh, the wall last year was filled. We had over 100. It, it was amazing. So this year, it's virtual. And I want to share that with you all. This is the first time anyone has gotten to see this. Uh, it will be posted on our website, uh, so enjoy. And then afterwards, I have a few comments and then we will move on to our closing keynote.
Okay. At this time, we would like to thank any veterans or guests in our audience to speak or share any experiences. Just feel to uh, feel free to unmute yourselves. Uh, just be courteous of uh, everybody else that might be trying to speak. I'm not a veteran, but I'm Sharon Painter and I'm one of the veteran services advisors. And I wanted to highlight Daniel Lucas. He just logged out, but he said he had to go back to work, but he's one of my students. And the same with Eric Galavis. Um, thank you for your service. I'm not sure if there are any of our other students logged in today, but we, we thank you and um, LFCC is proud of you. Okay, well, uh, we are going to move on to our final guest speaker of the evening, uh, Professor Butch Austin. Well, I'm really honored to be here and uh, to you know share the stage with uh, all these incredible veterans that have spoke. Uh, I, it's really humbling for me and uh, I know I also want to thank my students that showed up for this. I know I offered extra credit for you to be here, but I have a feeling that you will ha be glad that you came just for what you get from it. So quick administrative note, uh, send me an email if you attended tonight and I will give you that extra credit. All right, so uh, we've heard a lot of really good speakers tonight. So what I'm primarily going to do, I'm going to actually play a couple of, I'm going to play a little presentation that I put together of my tour and. Afghanistan, and then play a couple of videos after it if there's time. And uh, the first video will be a unit that actually came into the same place that I was at and did the same job. So they made a neat little video, music video out of it. And then I'm going to play two, um, two video or three videos, two of them that honor uh, one of my friends who actually died in Afghanistan. And then the other one also uh, uh, honoring a friend who died while I was over there. So uh, without further ado, let me make sure I can get this up here. And I want to wish all of you a happy Veterans Day. I come from a long line of veterans, starting with my great-great-grandfathers on both sides of my family fighting in the Civil War. My grandfather on my father's side actually fought in World War I. My uncle, my dad's oldest brother, fought in World War II. And my dad fought in both Korea and in Vietnam. Most people don't realize, but only about 9% of the population has served in the military, and only about 4.5% have actually served in combat, but 100% get the benefits of our liberty and freedoms due to those who've served.
Actually, this may be the prettiest place I've seen in Afghanistan. I don't know if the film will show it as pretty as it is, but very green because it's near a river. At least down here, it's green. And it's, it's rocky and mountainous, of course. a couple minutes.
I took a little spill trying to get to the helicopter wreck. Found out we need to get on fast because there was enemy fire. Anyway, not a big deal. But I uh, hope you don't mind me showing you the next few slides of some of the projects we did, including building a trade school where we tried to teach some uh, Afghan, local Afghans, some trades that they could make a living with. The lady that you see on the left in the picture is actually an American Afghan nurse who came over to help us start a nursing school and she actually was able to teach uh, females how, how to be nurses. So. Our school started out small, but as we kept it going, it got it grew larger and larger and was pretty good success. We built several things like schools, clinics, even wells, so they could have clean water, several different things. And this is actually a school we had built that we were dedicating to the people. This was a girls' school that we built. Uh, we actually built radio stations and handed out thousands of hand crank radios so we could get our message out to the people. They were really happy to get a certificate from the United States for their graduation. The gentleman on the ground was actually a nursing instructor from a college in Texas, and he was able to teach some of our nursing programs too.
Lord Fairfax actually sent over some shoes and that really helped us because that was a big demand, uh, demanding it, a big product that they really wanted a lot of. So that gave us a, a way to kind of make some inroads to a lot of the civilians. These were actually some of our soldiers posted outside of the girls' school because the Taliban were actually threatening them when they came to school. President of Afghanistan at the time came to visit our schools and see what we were actually doing in our projects. This is a mosque in Kandahar right outside the airport. And this is the post I lived on, eight and a half acre post that used to be a special forces post. This was a group of migratory people that were called the Kuchi people. And they would kind of uh, migrate according to the season. And sometimes that caused some issues with the local areas that they were migrating through. And we happened to kind of run across some of them when we were going out on a mission one time. This is more of a typical Afghan dwelling. Now, this right here, we were actually delivering wheat seed to the locals, trying to encourage them to grow wheat and not grow poppy because it's a big uh, opiate uh, drug market there. And this is some of the Afghan army that was helping us do that mission. That was a, that was an interpreter and a soldier giving out the wheat to some of the locals to again, encourage them to grow wheat. Right before I left, uh, the gentleman sitting beside of me in the back, he was a local, he was in charge of the this Afghan forces on it. As part of the presentation, with this monument that sums up all veteran service. All gave some and some gave all. I hope you'll always appreciate the sacrifices that veterans have made for our country. And I, I know we're on, we're kind of strapped for time, so I'm just going to go ahead and end my presentation there. Thank you so much, Professor Austin. He always has uh, Professor Austin always has great visuals and uh, pictures. He's very very good at uh, making sure he documents all of his trips. So uh, it, it's wonderful to see everything you present, uh, Professor Austin. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, coming out tonight. John F. Kennedy uh, said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what can you do for your country? Veterans are owed the highest debt of gratitude for always asking what they can do for country. The men and women of the armed services have made sacrifices that would be unimaginable to many of us in the name of the bright light of democracy. We honor your courage, your dedication, and the sacrifices you've made to keep the United States safe and to spread our goodwill through medical care, through education, through training with many of our allies, and our partners around the globe. And General Freakley, I thanks to you for making sure we feel safe during this time um, and assuring us when maybe some, some of us are nervous about the election. At LSCC, it is our honor to partner with our veterans in the community and serve our veteran students. 
May we do our part to show our gratitude for your hard work and your courage and your sacrifices. Thank you for joining us to celebrate and honor our veterans. I send you on your way with gratitude and wishes for your safety and wellness. Have a wonderful evening.